today um, a brief outline of the program for some of you that might be new and um, taught to this forum anyway or this presentation. I will go through some of the strategic themes of the program, some of which we already discussed today around pain management, hearing and eye health, um, some of the stats from the last uh, year or so, um, program growth and maturity, um, some of the feedback that we've gotten from patients and some of the stats you saw on that, in that quiz were from that survey, as well as what we're looking forward to in the 9th and 20 year. Um, just before I get in, I just want to thank Debbie for that wonderful address and that vote of confidence in RDN. Um, I just want to emphasize this is a partnership. We couldn't do what we do without the people on the ground. So um, we really do value that. And it's a, it's a team effort. Um, we have a sm relatively small RDN team, um, but we have a very large um, team across the region. And Debbie, you're definitely part of that team, <laughs> as is everyone in this room. Um, there's about 1,100 I estimate 1,100, 1,200 people involved in the outreach program. So those are the actual outreach practitioners themselves, about 900 of you, um, which represent about half the room today, by the way. Um, the other two or 300 are uh, health administrators, um, people that are very passionate about uh, rural and Aboriginal health, but do what they can to support those services and make sure operations um, keep going. Um, so why outreach? Um, uh, there's six different outreach programs that are funded by the federal government. Um, ultimately is to increase access to specialized services for rural communities and Aboriginal communities. The different programs have the different areas of focus, Aboriginal health, hearing health, eye health, chronic disease, uh, general access, but ultimately it's about access for patients and we do that by supporting a, a rural health workforce to deliver that care. And uh, at an average 21 minutes to access a service in a remote town is pretty remarkable. Um, and I have to attribute that to the great work that uh, the people in this room do. Um, there's three ways that we increase access. It's not only distance, um, that's the big one in rural, rural health, but it's also cost. Um, a lot of people, uh, our constituents, uh, live in low socioeconomic circumstances. They cannot afford uh, costly services, whether it's a big gap fee or whether it's the cost of traveling to a major city. Um, I don't have to tell you this. This is something you know intuitively from your work. Um, the other big barrier is cultural safety. There may be a uh, public service in in the vicinity, but if it's not culturally safe, many uh, people, particularly Aboriginal people, mightn't be comfortable accessing the service, and that's just a bigger barrier as the service is not being there at all. Um, so those are the three barriers that we work with you on in, in its simplest form. Um, another big component of the outreach program and some of the comments from today's earlier presenters um, are around strengthening the capacity of the rural health workforce, uh, the capacity of, um, of communities by investing in those communities. Um, we utilize rural health and remote workforces in our, is our first preference. So we work with you to identify people and providers in the region before we go out. There's a number of reasons for doing that. Um, we, um, it costs less, but also it's more sustainable. People within the community know the community actually are delivering the care, or they might come from a nearby regional town where that patient can be referred to for, for tertiary care if it can't be addressed in an outreach setting. So that's a really important model, and it, it, is, a, it is a regional and rural workforce predominantly. Um, uh, we, learn, uh, our, we learn and exchange skills and by providing outreach services. So it's the visiting practitioners themselves often comment on, you comment on how much you learn uh, from working in an outreach setting, but also vice versa. There is um, upskilling and skills transfers that occurs through, um, by working in close proximity with people in the rural, regional and rural areas. Um, and there's a, definitely a coordinating element to the outreach program. There is, there is a coordination program specifically in, in the eye health space, but the way services are designed is, is with the input of, of usually all of the stakeholders in the region, your PHN, your LHD, your AMS, and others, and they design what the model should be, and, and, and that, that process actually integrates the, the outreach service with the other services in the region. Um, these are the programs. I won't labor on all of them. You know what they are, um, but it's a good uh, summary of the services. There's, there's a 20 or 30 page guideline for each of those, but essentially that's the eligibility criteria, the funding time frame that we've got for them at the moment, um, and what the key objective is. Um, going on to our, some of our strategic themes, so across the program, um, in the 2017 outreach form, we actually did a workshop session where we pooled your knowledge um, on what our strategy should be for the 1720 period, and we're just about to go into our last year of that three-year cycle. Um, culturally safe services, key theme, uh, looking at our impact in terms of outcomes, and we'll go through some of that today, hopefully. Um, maintaining support and focus on telehealth is a, an excellent way to augment or enhance our services and increase access. 
um, value for money. Um, Deb mentioned that this morning, but it is absolutely one of the cornerstones of our program and has allowed us to grow. Um, and some of the individual programs have different priority, priority areas. Um, outreach is a gap-filling program, ultimately. Um, the, the, the fraction of funding that this program represents is less than a fraction of 1%. It's really it's a tiny program. But it, uh, so it, it's really important for us to be very precise and very accurate with the way that that funding is used to address a specific service gap. And we rely on the knowledge of the people in this, organization, in, in this room uh, to tell us where the service gaps are, which ones are the priorities, and how, how we should deliver those services. And then we resource you to deliver those services yourselves. Um, pain management has been discussed. So that's something we can look forward to. Um, it's only um, back of a napkin, half a million per, per annum. In this, in this financial year, it's an example of a small amount of money that might have a very large impact. We don't know how to deliver this in New South Wales at this stage, but we will come and talk to you and ask you how to do it. We'll ask you about what services are in your region already and um, where are the gaps in that pathway and how can we fill those gaps, including looking at best practice around pain management. Uh, so please look forward to that. And uh, any, any ideas you have on that uh, between now and the next few months when that formally happens, please just speak to someone in the outreach team or flick us an email. We lo we'd love to chat with you. Um, chronic disease prevention, something that we'll focus on. I'll, we'll go through some slides on that. Um, outreach student placements is something uh, that we've done, uh, we've always done in the program, but we've done in a big way with about 50 students that have actually, uh, allied health and medical students and nursing students that have actually accompanied outreach practitioners on outreach clinics. And um, my colleague Chris Russell will, will present on that tomorrow. Um, I believe one of the students will present with, with him. Um, ophthalmology expansions uh, to increase access to the area of health, which we know is um, disproportionately represented in limited access for Aboriginal people. Um, and um, hear, uh, work in hearing health uh, in terms of delivery of services and, and coordinating those services. Um, this is the reach, uh, quickly, of the program across New South Wales. Um, almost 180 towns. Um, and the little bubbles you see are the number of clinic hours that have been provided. This is the 17-18, uh, sorry, the 18-19 financial year. Um, tomorrow there will be a little quiz around uh, when we will have reached our millionth patient. Uh, it, it happens in this quarter, and we'll ask you to work that out, <laughs> just to st <laughs> stimulate. Um, so key, key stats, I already mentioned the millionth patient. We're running at about 200,000 occasions of service a year, slightly beating last year every year, but it is very incremental growth. Um, uh, 90 full-time equivalent practitioners, so those 900 people all added up and make 90 full-time equivalents, excluding travel time, that's actual clinic time sitting in front of patients. Um, uh, we've got 198 towns. Um, we represent 30 medical specialties and 27 allied health and nursing disciplines. Um, and speaking of partnerships, uh, 357 host facilities actually host the outreach services, including 87 GP practices, 41 ATCHES, that's all ATCHES in New South Wales, including those in urban areas, um, 13 LHDs, 4 PHNs, and 23 NGOs. And not, there's a cross-section of those organizations here today. So that's the, that is the whole outreach team. That is the, that is the, the reach of this program. Um, I think you've probably heard me say this before, those of you that have been to this, uh, this session. Uh, outreach has been a story of growth and maturity. So there was a period where there was a lot of value for money work done in terms of identifying uh, savings and efficiencies in the program. And now the program is plateauing. And it's a, our focus now is on enrich enriching those services, not necessarily delivering more clinic hours and services, but enriching them with better, best clinic clinical practice and local knowledge and seeing how impactful they can be, including activities like um, not only treating patients, but doing work to um, support prevention of disease. Um, and there's a few examples here, and we really rely on your, yourselves and your local knowledge to enrich those services, but something that is certainly a continuing theme that we'd like to work with you on. Um, uh, you can see the growth and maturity continues here. Uh, since about 2013-14, there was a lot of savings identified in the program, and that was reinvested into new services. And that's where you, these are the outputs now that you can see now in terms of access. Um, doesn't make uh, doesn't tell you people are healthier, but it tells more, more people are actually accessing the outreach programs. Um, copies of these slides are, are available for for later if I, if I rush through them quickly. Um, so talking about value for money, uh, you can see the 2013-14 and 17-18 financial years and the differences. 
in terms of activity that we've we've grown on average uh, in terms of clinic hours of so 17% each year. This, uh, patients have also increased at the same rate on average. Uh, Aboriginal patients have increased 22% each year, and we've reduced the cost on average by 13% each year. To use what Richard's phrase, I don't know if we can squeeze that lemon much tighter, <laughs> uh, but but we do try, and uh, so, uh, interestingly, we've reduced costs again for the 1920 financial year, which is obviously contrary to normal CPI and inflation, which in the health sector is actually higher than the average for for the economy. So that is remarkable. Again, I have to attribute that to the to the wonderful work we do with you to plan services, and um, and the trade-offs and decisions we make to innovate and deliver services in a more cost-effective and sustainable way. Um, chronic disease prevention. Uh, this is a, it's a, a small project that's attached to one of our outreach services that we partner with Murama Aboriginal Health Service. I don't think anyone from Murama is here today. No. Um, essentially, we do have outreach services that go and deliver chronic disease clinics, but we'd like to get them out into the field and doing chronic disease pre uh, prevention. So this was a a sporting day where um, the community went around to different health checks and they got a jersey when they completed the health checks. Some uh, celebrities came out there, and that was a great day for the community. That's an example of where we want to work in, in the health promotion, chronic disease prevention side, and using the, the outreach network and, and, um, and providers to be involved in that and, and contribute their expertise to those, the, the design of those types of programs. Um, this is another example uh, on the Illawarra, the South, Coast, South Coast area, where um, the Aboriginal yeah, the Atches in the region, as well as um, the LHD and Brian Holden Vision Institute um, took the opportunity to use their visiting optometrist to upskill, uh, upskill uh, not only providers but also staff in the region to um, discuss what eye health pathways look like, how patients sh should be managed, how to manage their records. Um, that's the kind of capacity strengthening this program can have that doesn't, isn't always necessarily measured the number of patients you see. It's actually enriching the capacity of those services. Um, and Kalina is here today. And she was definitely involved in that. <laughs> Thank you, Kalina. Um, uh, generally, in the eye health space, um, it is seen by the Commonwealth as a, an area of focus in terms of resources. Quite a few of the programs specifically respond to eye health services. I won't rattle them all off here. Um, but th there's a flow-on effect not only to the outreach clinics in terms of ophthalmology and optometry services, but other uh, organizations that deliver services um, in the region, including um, Optometry uh, Australia, who partner with us on the uh, statewide advisory group. Uh, there's Vision Australia, and Janelle showed us here today, uh, who partners with us on a pilot to um, change access criteria for the spectacle scheme. This is a state, it's a state program, not attached to the outreach program, but we do coordinate uh, our work with other organizations to collectively actually move those dials, actually improve those health outcomes and access to services. Um, it's just an example of, of collaboration where a lot of agencies work together and um, we can share in the, the impact that we have. There's still a lot to do. We can't rest on our laurels. Um, and we're looking to do a similar thing in the hearing health space. Um, uh, the expansion or the increasing access to ophthalmology services for Aboriginal communities continues to be a significant theme that has been raised in almost every rural region and some urban regions in New South Wales. Um, some, some areas have developed collaborative relationships with their stakeholders and providers and negotiate bulk billing pathways um, and flow on effects to, uh, to procedures and, and surgery. Um, these are some of the models we're looking at and um, there's still a lot of work to do in this space. But in every, in every region, we are having conversations, or will have over the next few years or year, conversations with stakeholders to actually deliver, deliver a ophthalmology access pathway that includes consultations as well as procedures for that region. It, they're all they're, they're going to be different. They might involve telehealth. They might involve in-reach. Ophthalmology is an equipment-heavy specialty, so it's not always feasible to do that in, in that reach setting. We might be able to in-reach patients into an existing established clinic, potentially use optometry clinic spaces. Um, it'll be, the innovation will come from the regions, and there's a couple of good examples, for example, on the south coast um, of New South Wales. Um, we've established probably one of the, 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 early, the early services. It only took two years. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, this is the kind of grunt work, and going back to your comment, Debbie, about, um, you know, you have to keep leaning in on these, on these problems uh, in order to make systemic change, uh, both in the hospital system and the private health system and the Aboriginal health system, to make all these 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 um, 
connections work. Uh, this is a picture that I love. It's one of the most remote communities we have. This is a town in Grawin. I don't know if you've heard of Grawin. I hadn't before I got involved in this program. <laughs> uh, population of about 100 people. Uh, this is the clinic, the optometry clinic, delivered by Kyriakos, is in the pub. Uh, they have assured us that they do it before happy hour. Uh, happy hour starts, and uh, so the clinical safety side is, is sorted. But um, that's kind of the innovation that comes from like seeing a problem and working with, working with uh, the community to deliver a, a workable service. Um, I just want to acknowledge the, the really uh, remarkable uh, clinicians here in the room, but like the 900 people that deliver outreach services continuously. Uh, you tend to stay with a program for a very long time. Uh, you're, you're the retention, right? Um, you must love it, <laughs> getting, getting on those uh, planes early in the morning or consistently working with those communities. Uh, um, the program has been around for about 18 years, actually, in different forms. The current incarnation is this range of programs, but it has been around since about 2001. Uh, so we're starting to see some of the early people that got involved with the program reaching retirement. So this is an example. Um, Dr. John Eden has gone up to Maury for almost 10 years. Uh, it's just an acknowledgement of the impact an individual can have. He's worked with the team at Pius um, HealthWise and others in, in the region to deliver these clinics. And this is a community that wouldn't have access to gynecology services in town without him visiting there. Importantly, he has arranged for three female gynecologists to take his place. And that's the kind of thing we like. So, so if you're planning on retiring, please let us know. And we'll, uh, we'll work with you on a succession plan. Uh, um, I'll go through some of the stats from the health practitioner and patient surveys. Um, just checking how I'm doing for time. Yeah, I'm doing so good. Um, this is a question we ask every year, and it's fairly consistent. Uh, um, practitioner satisfaction with the program is, is generally generally good. It does vary from time to time. Whenever someone is extremely dissatisfied or dissatisfied, which is a smallish proportion, we do follow it up and inquire why. A lot of it's around um, coordination at a lo local level. Um, there are hiccups in the program. It's, it's a big logistical exercise, so we, we go and try to actually improve that service or work with our local fund holder to resolve whatever the issue is. Sometimes it's around funding. Unfortunately, we have to make funding decisions that are unpopular at times. Uh, but by and large, um, you're a very engaged and, and um, satisfied group. Um, uh, so communication is, is already there. And we asked the longevity question in terms of how long you're going to continue to work in the outreach program. And that's fairly consistent from year to year. We've, we've generally achieved around 75 to 80% indicating that they'll plan to work for another three years or more. So that's a real positive indication that this, this program is sustainable in terms of the workforce. And um, we work with the Commonwealth as best we can to make sure that those resources uh, are remain so we can continue to support you to do those, uh, to provide those clinics. Um, uh, importantly, uh, we talked about cultural, culturally safe services. We do require all health practitioners that are new to the program to undertake a uh, local orientation, and part of that is um, not only like a desktop uh, or formalized cultural safety training, but also a, an orientation with the local community, meeting local elders. Um, and we try to we watch that fairly closely. We have an obligation, obviously, to, to ensure that our services are culturally safe, and we rely on you and your expertise in that space to help us do that. Um, so you can see that the satisfaction of local orientation is pretty good, but we do need to push that needle up a bit higher. Uh, we need to, um, when people are dissatisfied or feel that, that orientation wasn't done all that well, we will work with you to see what else we can do um, to support that practitioner to feel well oriented and to feel culturally competent and safe in the way they deliver, deliver services. Um, uh, there's quite a few that haven't received cultural safety training in the last survey, so that's something we will be following up with, with all of you. Um, and again, your input on, on how to do that. It is an ongoing challenge, not only in this space, but in the health sector generally. It's something um, we, we rely on your expertise to, to support. This is how, the, how long they waited from referral to, uh, to actually seeing the clinician. So 42% 40, 40 waited up to a month, um, 60 at 64%, um, less than three months, which is probably similar to what someone would wait for in an urban setting. Um, I haven't done an empirical assessment of that, but my, my, my personal experience suggests that <laughs> that's, that's what it's like. Um, it's uh, 60, 60, sorry, 72% of non-Aboriginal 
patients waited less than one month and 64 Aboriginal patients less than, waited less than one month. So um, that's something, a gap that we have to close, but it is, it is pleasing to see that there is access and, and waiting times are not outrageous for the majority of, of referrals. Um, this is the average travel time question. 95% um, of patients travel less than one hour to access their service, uh, so which is, I think it demonstrates that the program actually does increase access. We do also ask qualitative responses to patients and when they, when they answer that question, uh, particularly what would they do if the service is not, was not there. A lot of them would say they indicated in their narrative that they wouldn't access the service so that they have to travel quite, quite significant distances. Um, which is obviously going to have an impact on their on their health outcomes in terms of their own knowledge and and the treatment of the of their conditions. Um, patient satisfaction. Uh, we've always had very very high patient satisfaction. It's almost ninety five percent. Sorry, ninety nine percent. It's always hovered between ninety seven and almost one hundred percent throughout the program. We do believe there's a bit of positive bias in there because they they're they're concerned about criticizing the outreach service and fear of the bureaucracy taking it away or doing something to it, uh, which we don't do, <laughs> so, by the way. Um, uh, and, um, but that is positive, and at least that trend is consistent. Uh, if anyone's dissatisfied, we, will, we do uh, offer to follow up with that patient. Um, measuring health outcomes is something that's always challenging to do in the health space, and you would all know that through your work generally in the in the health system. Um, we started to ask health outcome type questions in terms of health literacy and how they felt about their health. And um, you can see there, uh, so from the current survey, 99% of patients felt they had a better understanding of their condition. And we all know the impact of health literacy on, on one's ability to manage their own health. Um, and uh, last year we asked about how they felt about their health care and the majority, 89% um, felt that they're they um, felt better about their health. These are sort of functional health outcomes rather than empirical health outcomes, but a lot of literature suggests that can be even more important in some cases. Um, and it's nice, uh, there's, there will be a full report actually, by the way, that will circulate with all of the survey findings, but these are some of the highlights that we've pulled out um, at the moment. Right, so this is my last slide. <laughs> Uh, so look forward to these things in the 1920 year. Um, because of continuing planning and working with you, and we've squeezed a little bit more of that lemon, um, uh, that we will be funding 80 new services in the 1920 financial year. You know what they are because we've talked to you about them and they're in the plan. Uh, but I'm very pleased, pleased about that, and that's a position um, we've not been able to be in for the last couple of years. So we look forward to building those services with you over the next couple of months. Um, we can look forward to the Roth pain management expansion. As I mentioned earlier, that will be a comprehensive needs assessment involving certainly everyone in this room and all of the other stakeholders who we don't even traditionally engage with to deliver. Um, we'll continue supporting Aboriginal eye health coordination. We'll do that in partnership with AHMRC and all the ATCHES and the eye health sector more widely. Um, we'll continue to support ear health services, including a focus on ENT, access to ENT procedures for Aboriginal people, and potentially some work in the hearing health coordination space. There's a lot of other Commonwealth investments. I don't know if any of you have read the Sickens Miller report. There's a lot of Commonwealth investments into hearing health, and our, we'll be looking to work with all of those agencies to coordinate our, our response to hearing health needs. And we'll continue to support um, cultural safety, telehealth, um, support value for money, and um, look at opportunities to evaluate the impact of what we do. Um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much, and looking forward to chatting with you um, throughout, throughout the day. If you have any questions or suggestions about the outreach program, please approach me or any one of the outreach team. Um, we really do value your feedback back, and this is, a, this is an important opportunity for us to do that, so thank you very much.